tonight on CBC Vancouver News. My house burned to the ground. Memories and homes gone as wildfires rage and hundreds are forced to flee. Plus, we remain very optimistic that, you know, that this can work. The search for a rare kidney and the Surrey family desperate to save their mother. There, it is more of a buyer's market. It's still really expensive. And slumping home sales as the real estate market enters a new cycle. What it means for buyers and those who jumped the gun. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Bath. BC real estate is in the middle of a change or a new cycle in technical terms, meaning we're seeing a big drop in sales coupled with a rise in supply. So what does this all mean for people looking to buy a home and is it going to get any easier? Our Yasmin Gandam went on the hunt. It's a new market cycle and experts say buyers are cautious when it comes to entering the market. The caution, uh, especially on the home buyer side, is really being driven by interest rates, uh, the rise in interest rates, as well as the inflationary um, concerns. The caution, he says, is causing the market to slow. And while the average price of a home in B.C. has been on a slight decline from $2.3 million in March to just over $2 million in July, it's still expensive. The cost of owning a home for most people, especially first-time buyers, has really continued to explode uh, over the last few years. But some realtors say current market conditions are still good news for buyers. It is more of a buyer's market certainly than it was last year when it, there was 10 offers on every property practically. Now there's one offer or maybe there's no offers. So it's a, it is a better time for buyers. But these first time buyers in Vancouver say they're still priced out. Saving stuff in a, in a city like Vancouver, especially for, for young people, you know, just years out of university. so. Uh, certainly working towards it. it. Might be renting for a while. It's still really expensive. You have to be making like 90k, if not more than that, by yourself to be making rent, thousand dollar rent. Um, yeah, it's not a buyer's market at all. For now, perhaps it's still window shopping for many who can browse the more than 10,000 listings currently up in Metro Vancouver, 400 more than this time last year. Yasmin Gandem, CBC News, Vancouver. Turning now to the wildfires burning in our province, there are now six of note, the Karameas fire being one of them. Our Benit Brach joins us live now from Penticton. Benit, it's been a favorable couple of days in terms of weather, but you've been out there all day, so what have you noticed? Well, Anita, I'm just here in Penticton, right outside the evacuation center. And, you know, driving in today, you could feel there was a wildfire. You could smell that smoke in the air. And right now it's quite ashy. So when I look into the sky right now, I can see an orange and brown haze in the sky. But, you know, the fight is on. Helicopters are in the air. Sprinklers are on near the wildfire. And people are just doing their best to cope with the losses and, and fight this blaze. <laughs> This moment, a slight escape from devastation. Ashes just started raining all over my property and the uh, firefighters came and told me to get out of the area. And shortly after that, my house burned to the ground. Les Merja spent more than a decade building his dream home off grid. That home now left in ashes by the Karameas Creek fire. Incredibly sad. Yeah, yeah I lost everything. Mirja left with very little. His harmonica is amongst the few things he could grab. The Karameas Creek fire between Karameas and Penticton has prompted evacuation orders for over 300 properties, with almost 500 more told to be ready to go. My house burned so thoroughly and completely that there is literally, you know, six inches of dust on the ground. Theo and Anna say they were the first to report the massive fire. On Friday, the blaze was spotted behind their backyard. It sounded like a roar. It sounded like a jet engine. It was incredible. That fire has now turned into this, an area six times the size of Vancouver's Stanley Park. But officials say it's being fought with full force from the ground and sky. 
fire is fairly cooperative with us. There are, there are some areas that are seeing an uptick. The Apex Ski Resort remains evacuated. Over 200 firefighters are on the mountain helping fight the flames. It's definitely not improving. Um, it is definitely creeping towards the village, but it's creeping slowly and slow is good. Snow machines are on 24 hours a day as another line of defense, adding much needed moisture to the village area. He says he remains optimistic that crews have a handle on the situation. In BC, there are now six wildfires of note, four in the Kamloops fire area and another two in the Southeast Fire Center near Cranbrook. The vast majority of wildfires that are actively burning right now are caused by lightning. We saw a lightning event move through many areas of the province Friday and Saturday that we anticipated and saw a lot of new starts from those uh, storms. And as fire sparks, it's all hands on deck to fight the blazes and keep communities safe. And it's still quite windy out here. The hope is that this weather cooperates. The wind holds off so crews can still battle these flames. And as I said before, evacuation center is just behind me here, supporting people with housing, vouchers, whatever they might need. Anita? All right, Benit Breach live tonight in Penticton. Thank you. And with that, Johanna Wake's staff is off. Kaljeet Kayla is here with, I think, a bit of good news in terms of those temperatures Thank and you. what it all means for fires. Yes, we have this low pressure system that came in today. A broad band of it that's sweeping right, over the province is bringing rain and a chance of thunderstorms for northern BC, for the Kootenays. Uh, we're going to be seeing some uh, uh, conditions that are really going to be reducing in terms of temperatures. This low pressure system is bringing with it a cooling air mass. So temperatures are going to start to drop by about five to 10 degrees. Uh, since we've had our heat wave and heat warning from just a few days ago. And this means uh, great for the fire danger rating. We've already seen a bunch of changes already today. Uh, this entire area has gone from moderate to low to very low. We do still have some spots of extreme conditions in the Kootenays around Cranbrook, and that's where the temperatures continue to be quite high right now. Kelowna's at 28. Osoyo's hit 34 today, 32 in Castlegar. Lytton's at 26. These temperatures will drop, as will Abbotsford, which is at 20 today. Uh, average wise, uh, our low today was 15, above seasonal just slightly, and today's high was 19, 22 inland. Again, just around the seasonal part. For tomorrow's highs, look at the drops for tomorrow. We're down into the low 20s for most of the lower mainland and the Tri-Cities. I'll let you know how long this trend will continue later on this hour. Anita? I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Okay. Well, if you've tried filling up your vehicle in Metro Vancouver in recent days, you may have noticed some gas stations out of gas. Perhaps even seen one of these signs at the pump. Well, the supply issue is impacting a slim percentage of stations, but several locations have run empty. It's a trend that's expected to continue over the next few days, according to one fuel analyst. He says the shortage is a result of several factors, including recent scheduled maintenance at a Washington state refinery. The sort of perfect storm of scheduled turnaround, long weekend and falling prices. People traveled a little bit more, bought a bit more fuel than anticipated. The good news for drivers, the refinery is back up and running, so he predicts the shortage will be resolved by next week. Perhaps even better news, he expects gas prices will continue to drop in the coming days. Well, a family in Surrey is desperately trying to find their mother a new kidney. She needs a living donor, but as Ali Patarge tells us, a match is hard to come by because of her rare blood type. Sharab Hamal is flying out to Britain for work in September, so he's treasuring the time he's spending with his mother, Puna. My mom's a very positive person, and when you see her in public, you know, you don't really see that she has, like, a, a life-threatening kidney disease, really. The Hamals have been busy putting up posters around Surrey, pleading for anyone in the community who's willing to give her a kidney. In 2011, Poonam was diagnosed with IgA nephropathy, an incurable autoimmune disease that inflames one's kidneys to the point where they can no longer support their body. Poonam has been undergoing kidney dialysis since 2019, having to hook up to a machine every night for nine hours. It's taking a toll on her body, from back pains to headaches to swollen limbs. It's very painful. I want to stay happy all the time. I tried, but most of the time feel sad. It's very hard. Through her sickness, Poonam changed her diet, has been put on steroids, and waited and waited some more. It takes a while just because of the backlog for people. Uh, something that can take like a 15-minute test. Um, that may be a month, six weeks, two months of waiting. 
um, which is unfortunate. Um, but that's just the reality of it right now. But the best way to treat her disease is to get a new kidney from a living donor. And to the dismay of the Hamals, no one among her friends and family matched her B-positive blood type. The Provincial Health Services Authority says B-positive blood is harder to match because a smaller percentage of the population have this blood type, and they can only match with types B and O. Sharab then launched an online campaign called Kidney for Mum. Yeah, with that, a lot of people have called and said, I want to see if I can get tested. Uh, and hopefully something works out. I hope um, someone help me and I'll, my life will extend. And then I'll be continue, I'll be continue good person in the world. For now, they're making the best of family time. And Sharab says he'll continue the campaign even after he leaves town in the hopes of giving his mother a new lease on life. Ali Petarga, CBC News, Surrey. Premier John Horgan is pressing Ottawa for more financial relief to address the current health care crisis. It comes after a Victoria senior took out a newspaper ad in a desperate bid to find a family doctor. We need a national plan. That's been pretty clear. It's not just me. It's uh, conservative premiers, liberal premiers. It's not a question of uh, perspective. It's a question of necessity. And uh, the examples of having to put out an ad to get a prescription filled or other, uh, other families concerned about being able to access primary care is a real and pressing problem. Michael Mort and his wife Janet have been struggling to find a doctor since theirs retired in December. They recently needed some life-saving prescriptions renewed but couldn't get into a walk-in clinic until October. That's when panic set in and Janet decided to place the ad. The Morts say their efforts have paid off and they've been contacted by a doctor who can take them on. Nearly one million people in B.C. are without a family doctor. And some infants, toddlers and preschoolers got immunized against COVID-19 for the first time today. As the province rolls out the next phase in the fight against the disease, more than 200,000 kids between six months and under five are eligible for the first of two shots. Anxious parents who are waiting for the vaccine for their young children. Uh, we made appointments available in about 10 or 11 sites in Vancouver Coastal Health and they've been filling up fast this week but there's still room for parents who would like to register their children. Uh, they won't have to wait more than a few days to get their appointment. The dosage allowed for this age group in what a quarter of these over 12 receive, and it is the first of two jabs that experts are recommending four weeks apart. Well, Vancouver fire crews have been called to a large blaze on the south side of the city. <laughs> Pops and explosions could be heard after the fire broke out at a property near 64th and Columbia near Marine Drive. No word yet if anyone has been hurt, and it's not clear how the fire began, but smoke could be seen across the city and as far away as the North Shore. We'll bring you any updates we can later in the show and on your late news at 11 o'clock. A public warning is out about 11 men who police say are linked to gang violence. Officers say these individuals could be targets for future violence and they pose a significant risk to the public. Family, friends and other associates of these men are being asked to be careful. One of the suspects has two of his brothers who have already been gunned down. Meninder Dhaliwal was shot dead in a highly public venue in Whistler just 10 days ago on July 24th, along with one of his associates. Two individuals were charged with first-degree murder in this incident on July 25th, thanks to the efforts of our RCMP partners in the Sea to Sky and the Integrated Homicide Investigation Team. Meninder Dhaliwal's brother, Barinder Dhaliwal, is on the list of 11 public safety threats being released today. His other brother, Harpreet Dhaliwal, was killed in another highly public shooting in Coal Harbour in Vancouver in April of last year. Police say they are aware of several conflicts involving a number of groups and are expecting the violence to continue in the coming weeks and months. Well, Canada's fastest growing metropolitan area now has the highest crime rate of any major city in the country. Stats Canada says Kelowna has by far the highest crime rate of 30 metropolitan areas in Canada. The annual report shows the city had just over 11,000 crimes per 100,000 people in 2021. That's an increase of 10% over 2020.
I am not here to tell you that we don't have a problem that needs to be responded to. I am here to tell you that these concerning statistics are ones that we are actively working on. And I'm here to tell you that we will continue to provide that policing service to our community in a dedicated and focused approach to make sure that we are addressing safety in our community. The superintendent says even minor infractions skew the stats based on population. She says the province has to step up responsibility for social services and prolific offenders. Tents along East Hastings on the downtown east side were ordered to be removed by today, but the city says it's first finalizing storage options to secure people's personal belongings before the removal begins. Any removal won't start now until next week. We sent our cameras to the downtown east side to hear from those living in the tents who say they have nowhere else to go. We've only been here for a few days now because uh, my SRO got pretty violent, so I left there to leave the violence and then come here to find out that uh, the violence is going to come from the police or the fire department kicking us out of here. We hear people getting shot, the women are getting hurt. People can't even get into their buildings because of the tent city down here. If it was just the homeless, it would be different. It's not homelessness down here. You have gangs that come in and set up. They attack our police force. I searched for another location. I searched for two months for another location. I actually had to give my cat away, who I love very much, to one of my friends. Yesterday I had to give my cat away, which was a very depressing thing, but she couldn't stay down here with me. The first time in 32 years that I don't feel safe down here. I find the violence doesn't come from a lot of the local people that have been here for a long time. It comes from people that are new here that uh, thinks that violence is just the way it is with this many people, right? They think with the drugs and stuff, it's supposed to be violent, but I've been around here for 20 years and there's no violence before. There's people in violence, but it was small. Here, it's like every half an hour on the hour, there's a fight or somebody screaming at somebody, but there's also a lot of sadness and a lot of mental illness. You put these people in housing, the houses are destroyed, their homes are destroyed within 24 hours. Well, the SRO was, uh, had a couple of bullies in it that would, uh, a couple times a week, would get sick for their drugs and wouldn't be able to afford it, and they're a lot bigger than me and the other guys, the older men that are there, so they'd actually push in doors and punch people out for their, for their money, for their drugs, for their stereos, for their TVs, whatever they could get to sell. The long-term solution for these people, open up a mental institution and put them in there. There is violence here too because there's drugs and there's all the bad stuff that goes along with it, but the reality is it's still a lot safer here than there because there I get caught in a room and I'm stuck. A live shot right now as dozens of people gather in Langley for a vigil after a horrific shooting in that city a week and a half ago. A gunman shot four people in a six hour spree of gun violence. Two of those hit died along with the alleged gunman. Politicians, advocates and community members are coming together tonight to mourn and offer support to the homeless community who seem to have been targeted. Moving now to Vancouver Island, where a new post-secondary campus will soon open in Langford, just outside of Victoria. The $98 million property will be the first of its kind, offering a range of courses put on by four schools, including UVic and Royal Roads University. Premier John Horgan says the campus will also benefit area residents forced to travel outside their communities for post-secondary. We can now start to push up those rates of participation in post-secondary education here in, in the West Shore. We have very high graduation rates, among the highest Indigenous graduation rates in the province. But it starts to fall off when uh, young people start to think of a three-hour uh, commute there and back to the University of Victoria. Construction of the new campus is already underway. The property is expected to open to approximately 600 students in the fall of 2024. The other two schools are the Justice Institute of BC and Camosun College. The Canadian Forces Snowbirds will not be flying in this weekend's Abbotsford International Air Show. The Snowbirds say because of a crash on takeoff in Fort St. John yesterday, they won't be performing Friday, Saturday or Sunday. 
The flight safety team needs to do an investigation into their planes following well-established procedures. They are the marquee act at the Abbotsford Air Show and say they're disappointed they won't be performing. But rodeo fans in the Lower Mainland do have something to look forward to next month. Langley is going ahead with plans for a rodeo over the Labor Day long weekend. The Valley West Stampede is the first professional rodeo to be hosted in the township. It will feature horse and bull riding, as well as food trucks, live music, and indigenous demonstrations. Some groups are speaking out against the event. The BCSBCA says it's concerned about animals experiencing pain and distress, but organizers say the animals involved will be looked after. Well, the neat thing about the Valley West Stampede is we don't actually have any roping events. We're strictly focused on riding events. So we have the four main events, which is the ladies barrel racing, saddle bronc riding, bareback riding and bull riding. So what makes this neat is that all the animals that are used in this rodeo are all bred specifically for these events. The rodeo is sanctioned by Pro Rodeo Canada and it will run for three days from September 3rd to 5th. With real estate prices on the downturn, could more homeowners go underwater? What it means and whether you need to worry, next. Thanks for watching our commercial free live stream. Well, if you've always dreamed of becoming a pilot, now might be the perfect time to start training. In Alberta, flight schools are struggling to attract students despite a very high demand for trained commercial pilots in Canada. As anyone who's traveled by air lately can tell you, the aviation industry is short on commercial pilots. They're so desperate for pilots, both in Canada, both in the United States and overseas. And as large airlines work to recruit, offering considerably higher salaries, it's leaving smaller carriers, charters, air ambulances and flight schools short on staff. Everybody if schools lose seven. too many instructors, the industry may find itself short of pilots and not enough people to train them. Mohawk climbing through 700 for 3,000. If there's very few pilots going into instructing, then it's going to slow down the ability to produce pilots, which could ultimately mean that we are unable to get pilots even at the entry level. Canada has already seen a significant drop in the number of commercial licenses issued over the past three years, with many potential applicants citing expense as a major deterrent. It costs about $80,000 to train as a pilot, and there aren't many financial supports available. Student Aid Alberta provides 45000 The rest, students have to find elsewhere. I can definitely see where families with lower income or new immigrants who are definitely going to be more cash-strapped and having more difficulties getting into the profession, especially when we're so desperately short across the industry, especially women as well too. Flying schools in the Edmonton area have been trying new things to remain competitive. Knowing that new pilots who graduate with a degree are more likely to succeed in the industry, Cooking Lake Aviation has partnered with Solomon College to offer flight training in conjunction with academic education. We believe that we can mesh that together, create a unified structured program that will give them benefits of both in the shortest period of time. But for long-term sustainability, industry insiders say we may have to change how different roles within aviation are viewed and valued. I think we have to change the way we talk about flight instructing, that it's not just a stepping stone, that it's actually a really good, valuable part of, of becoming a good, solid pilot. Dennis Cofton, CBC News, Edmonton.
some potentially good news for home buyers in Metro Vancouver. The real estate board says even though prices are still high, the volume of home sales is dropping due to the rising interest rates. Almost 2,000 homes were sold in July. That's down 43% from last year. And for more on the possible impacts of this current real estate slide, we're joined by Brian Yu with Central One Credit Union. He's the chief economist there. Brian, real estate stories can be complicated, a lot of numbers and terms that aren't really digestible for everyone. So can you break down for us your reaction to today's news in terms of what it means? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear right now we are in a, uh, a real estate correction, uh, not only in Vancouver, but also in other parts of Canada, particularly in the Toronto area. Uh, but we are seeing a significant slide in overall sales flow, uh, some of the weakest numbers since uh, about, I would say, the early 2000s, the late 1990s. And home prices are on sliding as well now. Okay, so with prices down, not significantly, but they are coming down, what does that all mean for people who, let's say, bought a home at the peak recently and are now seeing their values drop? Could they essentially go underwater? Well, it depends on the buyer, obviously, but we are seeing uh, some significant declines in overall prices from the peak uh, from early 2022. Uh, the numbers are around uh, in the Greater Vancouver area, down about 10% for detached and townhome prices, 5% for condo prices. Uh, so it really, it depends on the, the buyer. Uh, first time buyers typically would be in the condo market. Uh, they would uh, potentially put around 10% down. Uh, so we would expect them to be some, uh, some weakening there for uh, their, um, for their purchases. Uh, those are who are in the repeat buyer, the, the and move up buyer section, they tend to have higher down payments just for the requirements to get the loan. Um, so yeah, so they have lost money as well, but uh, likely uh, they're, I don't think they're underwater. I think they have seen uh, some uh, uh, decline in their overall wealth just due to the uh, overall price corrections though. And can you just actually explain what it means to be underwater for those who don't know? Uh, essentially owing more and then uh, your mortgage you're, you're losing you owe more than what you uh, sorry your your valuation of your home is, is more than your um, the equity in it uh, so again I think for for the most people I think they're okay they've seen a, a correction in the market they are uh, have lost money from the peak but overall in terms of um, uh, this is a, a sort of a broad slowdown in the market right now what do buyers right now need to be thinking about uh, I, I think buyers right now can be patient so they're in a, in a quite a a challenging situation in that uh, interest rates, of course, have gone up uh, quite considerably. Fixed rates have been up for some time, but now we're seeing variable rates moving in lockstep with the Bank of Canada as a hikes. Uh, so they're going to be a little more cautious. Um, prices are coming down, so they can be, again, be more patient, look for the, the right home uh, that they need. Uh, and again, making sure their finances right now uh, can move with unexpected uh, rate moves as well. Okay, and finally, I just want to touch on the Fraser Valley a little bit. Are we seeing, uh, you know, similar movement there, similar changes there to what's happening in Metro Vancouver? Yeah, I, I think so. What we've seen so far is that the Fraser Valley has seen a little bit more of a of a downturn than um, the Greater Vancouver area. They are obviously moving, aligning, uh, but during the pandemic, a lot of individuals had moved uh, to the suburban markets into the Fraser Valley to take advantage of uh, relatively lower prices as well as uh, as a, a demand for land. Um, and those areas, given the affordability constraints, are taking a, 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 a hit right now as um, many of those buyers are no longer qualifying for the loans. Brian Yu, Chief Economist with Central One Credit Union. Thank you. Thank you. Helping women cross state borders as they seek abortions. The latest U.S. federal move after the defeat of Roe versus Wade. That's next. near disaster in Vancouver today when a plane crashed just short of the city's airport. The DC-3 aircraft slammed into the ground as it tried to make an emergency landing, barely missing a crowded residential subdivision. More from the CBC's Karen Mason. This was the scene just moments after impact. The DC-3 had only just taken off from Vancouver International Airport when the pilot noticed a problem. He radioed the tower that he was turning back to try an emergency landing. He came in over the townhouses, yeah. and uh, it looked like he was going to hit the corner of this building, but he lifted up his wing, he missed it, and I lost sight of him. He came across. When we came around the corner of the building, got up top here, he uh, had already crashed and was 
and flames. As it was coming in uh, through this construction site here, it struck some uh, power lines, uh, turned about 90 degrees east, and then it crashed on the dike here. There were only three people on board the plane. It's a cargo plane, no passengers, and all three crew were ejected through the front window off the aircraft. Construction workers from a nearby development pulled the injured men away from the burning wreckage. They were pretty bad shape. Uh, one of them was uh, crying for, uh, for his uh, wife. Uh, said to call, the, call my wife and tell them what I happened. And we helped him to come out from the plane and uh, put him on the grass. Was, uh, then I took his shoes off and uh, he was badly burned. The three victims, two pilots and a mechanic, were rushed to Vancouver Hospital to be treated for burns and internal injuries. More than an hour after the crash, the wreckage of the plane was still burning, and power was out to much of the surrounding area. The World War II era DC-3 is considered to be one of the safest planes around. It's still not known for sure what caused this one to go down. Investigators were on the scene all day trying to find out. The wreckage will likely be moved from the crash site Sunday morning for further investigation. Karen Mason, CBC News, Richmond. Looking at health care now, in Ontario, doctors and nurses are sounding the alarm tonight amid growing concern about access to health care. Today, after weeks out of the spotlight, Ontario's premier stepped in front of the cameras to address it. His message, we're working on it, but right now Ontarians are getting the care they need. As Chris Reyes shows us, that is getting pushback from the front lines. At a meeting with auto workers, Premier Doug Ford was peppered with questions about hospital care in his province amid stories of closures, overworked staff and delays. Make no mistake about it, uh, there, there, there's a logjam, but 90% of the patients are getting taken care of when they're going in the hospital. But those on the front line say that number isn't acceptable. Nine out of 10 is not what I strive for. I strive for 10 out of 10, and God forbid that one out of 10 was my loved one. One, two, three. And that it doesn't account for a crucial chunk of time. It is routine to be waiting between an hour and two hours for patients to actually get from registration to triage. Ford admitted the province needs more nurses, touting a plan to hire some trained internationally and a bonus to keep some from leaving. We gave the nurses across the province a well-deserved $5,000 retention bonus. Personally, I would rather have staffing. I would rather have you know, the ability to be there for my patients, the ability to take my own breaks. A survey from the Registered Practical Nurses Association of Ontario found nearly half of those questioned are considering leaving the profession. We work in a system today that wouldn't even be able to, to tolerate a thousand leaving. But when you think of half of 55,000, we can see the devastation. Uh, that would take place across the system. The GTA. Jean Dench's partner had a stroke two weeks ago and waiting hours for an ambulance, her experience highlights delays across the system. People are really running ragged as far as the, just trying to give basic care. And it's not, it wasn't even bathed for almost two weeks. Dench challenges Ford to spend a day in a hospital to see the situation for himself.
They're getting the blood pressure taken, they're getting the other tests done, but there's no time for any humanity. Something patients and healthcare workers are echoing across the province. Chris Reyes, CBC News, Toronto. Joe Biden is responding again to June's controversial Supreme Court abortion ruling. As Muktak Ebersalesa reports, he's asking the health department to consider covering some out-of-state abortions with Medicaid funds. Cheers and tears from those in Kansas supporting abortion rights. On Tuesday, voters were asked whether the state's constitution should do away with abortion protections. 60% of voters said no. I'm super proud to be from Kansas tonight, and I feel like my state just showed up and boldly told me that they are going to take care of me and my female friends and everyone that can get pregnant in the state of Kansas. We are protected tonight. A statement from anti-abortion group Value Them Both said the result was a temporary setback. And, quote, while the outcome is not what we hoped, our movement and campaign have proven our resolve and commitment. In the wake of the Supreme Court ruling, leaving it up to individual states to decide if abortion is legal, more than a dozen states have already banned abortions or restricted them to up to six weeks of pregnancy, a time when many don't know they're pregnant yet. I'm going to sign this executive order right now. Today, President Joe Biden signed another executive order to protect abortion rights. It calls for the Secretary of Health and Human Services to do three things. One, find ways to make it easier for women seeking abortion to travel to other states, including through Medicaid. Two, ensure health care providers are complying with federal non-discrimination laws to make sure patients are getting the care they need. And three, do research and collect data on maternal health care outcomes. And that also will help safeguard access to health care, including the right to choose and contraception promote safety and security of clinics, patients, and providers, protect patients' privacy and access. We are doing all we can in my administration to protect the rights of health and safety of the people of this country. In July, President Biden signed the first executive order on abortion. It called for increased access to medication abortion and protections for anyone traveling to get an abortion. But still, about half the states are expected to eventually have abortion bans or limits in place. Magda Gebrasalasa, CBC News, Washington. Alex Jones, a U.S. conspiracy theorist who has spent years claiming the horrific 2012 mass shooting at a Sandy Hook elementary school was staged. He's recanted. I think Sandy Hook happened. I think it's a terrible event, especially since I've met the parents and... Uh, it's 100% real. Jones' admission came during a civil trial to determine how much he and his media company owe the parents of Sandy Hook victims. And in a dramatic twist, Jones was confronted with another apparent falsehood. You got the messages right there. You know it perfectly, right? I just want to make sure you know before we go any further. You know what it is. Yes, I do. I mean, I'm not a tech guy. I told you, I gave in my testimony the phone to the lawyers before whatever, and, and so you've got my phone, but we didn't give it to you. In an apparently accidental disclosure, Jones's lawyers provided plaintiffs with two years' worth of phone texts on Sandy Hook after he had testified under oath that he could not find any. Pope Francis is once again asking forgiveness for the abuses that Indigenous peoples suffered in Canada's residential schools. During his general weekly audience today at the Vatican, the Pope dedicated his talk to his trip to Canada. It was unlike other journeys. In fact, the main motivation was to meet the Indigenous peoples, to express to them my closeness and my sorrow. Uh, closeness of the church, my sorrow, and to ask forgiveness, forgiveness for the harm done to them. Francis apologized at several stops in Canada last week. Today, he again spoke about the role many members of the Catholic Church had in the harms done to Indigenous people. On the last day of his Canadian trip, the Pope met privately with residential school survivors in Iqaluit and heard their stories. Today, he called it a very painful moment and said, quote, we need to give face to our errors and our sins. 
There's renewed outrage over the business practices of Ticketmaster, triggered by ongoing and long-standing complaints about the ticket brokerage's so-called dynamic pricing. Tickets for an upcoming Bruce Springsteen tour were costing more than $5,000. The CBC's Thomas Daglow looks into the practice and the complaints and the apparent lack of solutions. Having made a fortune as a working-class music icon, Bruce Springsteen suddenly has some lifelong fans vowing, I'll never give this man another dollar, and others tweeting hashtag corporate greed. It is a hard pill to swallow when it's guy like Springsteen. When tickets went on sale for Springsteen's highly anticipated tour with the E Street Band, fans were shocked to see prices as high as $5,500 U.S. Consider some tickets to Elton John's upcoming Toronto show are going for nearly $2,500 with premium seats for the weekend in Vancouver on sale for even more. We are seeing these large companies that have next to no competition that are sort of able to charge whatever they want and they can justify it away because, you know, there's no alternative. At the heart of the controversy, the entertainment behemoth Ticketmaster and its near monopoly on sales for big shows and sports. The company allows marked up resales, but also uses so-called dynamic pricing, with some tickets automatically going up when demand is high. This business consultant says Ticketmaster's strategy ensures more money goes to artists instead of resellers. We could pretend that people aren't paying $5,000 to go to Springsteen if we like, but they were anyway. It's just a matter of who gets it. From the days of New Kids on the Block to Justin Bieber, concert goers have long complained of rising prices. But now as fans again flock to shows, prices have surged, with one recent report suggesting hot tickets across North America have risen in price nearly 20% since 2019. I don't think that's an easy one to solve, especially if an artist can only perform in that city for one night. Ticketmaster didn't respond to our questions and hasn't explained how it sets prices. Springsteen is still selling out concerts with enough fans willing to pay a premium. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Canada's vast boreal forests function as a massive carbon sink for the planet, but climate change is impacting them like never before. How they are faring is next. And at 6.41, a live look at the bottom end of Lake Okanagan. A much cooler day in Penticton, but the warmth is set to return. Aljeet has her full forecast coming up.
Welcome back. The boreal forest covers a big part of the Canadian landscape, stretching from Yukon all the way east to Newfoundland. But this vast natural factory that captures and stores carbon is changing along with the climate. CBC meteorologist Christy Klamenhaga has more. Canada is home to the world's largest relatively untouched forest. The boreal zone is home to Earth's coldest forest and stretches across Canada and around the globe covering 1.9 billion hectares globally. And the boreal forest is important. It not only serves as a huge carbon store, but a thriving ecosystems for plants and animals, including over 100 species of birds, mammals like moose and caribou, and 3.7 million people. Between wildfire, weather and other factors, the boreal forest is constantly changing, but climate change is bringing a new level of transformation. If we think about drought, if we think about fire, if we think about insects, disease, this large tract of forest is contending with all of these environmental threats all the time. But under climate change, at least some of these threats are more severe. As our climate changes, we can expect milder winters and hotter summers. That means a higher risk of drought and wildfire. So what does that mean for our forest's future? As the climate continues to warm, but the boreal biome might shift northward, as well as potentially a contraction of the forest along the southern margins. With growth to the north and recession to the south, the future health and size of the boreal forest system will come down to a matter of balance and timing. A lot of species that are depending on older mature forest, especially coniferous uh, forest in particular, there's just less of that um, habitat going to be available in the short term. So with all of this being said, is it too late to save our boreal forests? While some of the changes we're seeing may be inevitable at this point, we can still have an impact. We can work to protect our boreal forests, especially those that have the best chances of lasting, those with plenty of local water sources and more sheltered topography. Was it ever too late? to do something better, I would say no. I'm, I'm a little bit of an optimist, but we can never wind back the clock. Christy Kleimanhaga, CBC News, Edmonton. All right, Kaljit Kayla is here. And Kaljit, we have to pull up a live shot right now because look at this, rain outside our studio looking down Georgia Street. So you gotta tell us how much is coming. Mm hmm It's uh, long, been long awaited by some people, and this is why it's happening. It's because of this low uh, ridge of low pressure that came in uh, earlier today. It's bringing uh, cooler conditions for most of southern B.C., bringing more rain and thunderstorm activity for the Caribou and northern B.C. as well. So these record highs that we've been seeing are going to start dropping uh, in the next couple of uh, hours and into the overnight. Here's an example of this big cool down that's happening across B.C. Kelowna was at 28 degrees today. Tomorrow it'll tap out at about 20 degrees, 30 degrees for Cranbrook, 23 for uh, them tomorrow, and then 31 degrees for Penticton. It'll drop down to 23. This is great news for the fire danger rating as well because those areas have been in the extreme uh, conditions. Here's what you need to know. It's still going to be quite humid outside. Even though it is raining, UV index has dropped down to 5. Overnight lows of 15, and then tomorrow morning some wind picks up. This will further cool things down tomorrow, and then Thursday morning we're going to be seeing about a 60% risk of rain. So this rain that started here tonight could be on and off all night into tomorrow. Current temperatures outside right now on the west coast, 15 degrees for Prince George, 24 for Ash Ashcroft, 25 in Linton, and Calgary is a hot spot for Alberta at 23. And on the east coast, uh, we've got Montreal as a hot spot at 25 degrees. So uh, summer-like temperatures for them. Here's what's in store for us. Like I mentioned, rain tomorrow, then back to the sunshine for the weekend. Temperatures rising back up to 29 and 31 degrees uh, by the end of the weekend. So we're not not done with summer yet, but these are more comfortable temperatures than what we saw during the heat warning last week. Anita? For sure. Not bad at all. Thanks, Kaljeet. You're welcome. Well, as the end of summer nears, monarch butterflies will start migrating from Canada all the way to Mexico. They were added to the international list of endangered species last month. One of the key reasons for their decline is the loss of their habitat. But as Colleen Jones reports, one Nova Scotia man is on a mission to save a few of them. Peter van der Kluwet has learned a lot about the monarch butterfly. Oh, the, see the two dots on the yeah, hind wings? I did, I did. That tells you it's a male. Wow. The females don't have those dots. Yeah, I love the... See the compound eye? That... Monarchs might be plentiful now in the family's backyard garden, but a few years ago, noticing the declining population here, he became concerned. But how many of us move from concerned to citizen scientist? 
Peter did. This is probably a couple days from turning into one of one of the pupae. And from the pupae, they it turn. It becomes the butterfly. He protects the monarch's eggs one tiny egg at a time. That little dot right there is an egg. He heads to the mowed areas by the local rails to trails path. He looks for fallen leaves holding the tiny eggs that would be easy pickings for the predators, spiders, ants, and birds. So when you went out to the area that was mowed, you were looking for, for things those, that small? Yeah, it's like two by two millimeters or something. He has become the monarch's protector here in his own backyard, taking the eggs into his house for them to go through their various stages. You can see the little tip okay. of the curl yes. kind of below the eyes there. Yeah. It's a proboscis that's curled up and when they, they protrude. It's really cool. Like, I mean, I just, I kind of got into it because, well, I like them for one thing and the, the, they migrate, the fascination of it. Yeah. Like, I mean, just the, the uniqueness of the species. He takes notes to document the numbers since he began this project three years ago. 300 in the wild sightings. So. It's a lot of caterpillars, 471 that I count it. The chrysalis where they came. Is he making a difference? He likes to think so. He's also growing and transplanting milkweed, not just here in his garden, but in this new pollinator garden that volunteers have planted on rails to trails. When it's in the caterpillar stage, milkweed is the key ingredient for the monarch. Milkweed has been wiped out through the years because of pesticides, urban development, and mowing. But Peter, whose father Sam was a highly regarded botanist at Acadia University, keeps growing more. In North America, the monarchs are endangered, but Peter Vanderkluet, on his watch in his backyard, he's doing his best to make a difference. Oh, oh that's sweet. It flew oh right onto your God, finger. It did. <laughs> flew right onto your finger. Wow. Colleen Jones, CBC News, okay, Wolfville. Uh -huh. Flew right onto your finger. And the beauty of barrel racing how a mother and daughter are taking the reins in Saskatchewan. What's next? Firefighters from at least five municipalities battled a huge blaze that engulfed the old marina restaurant for an entire day, with reoccurring bursts of smoke and flames even into this evening. But in the end, there was nothing crews could do to save it. Flames broke out around lunchtime Saturday. No injuries were reported. Wendy Walker Bradley, who ate there almost every Friday, says it was a staple for the community. It's the only restaurant, often hosting everything from birthdays to weddings. It was terrifying and it was really sad. Like this place is like a little gold mine. This, you can't even get in here from cars being parked here every day. Lunch, dinner, full, full house. Walker Bradley says she and her husband watched truck after truck trying to put out the blaze. We were all very, very devastated, very sad, because it looked like it was, it was, it was under control. And then all of a sudden the flames just started coming out like it was like there's no way this is being saved, right? Longtime resident John Major also saw the fire. As we sat on our deck and we watched it all unfolding, the just smoke got more intense and intense and it, we, we watched it burn through the size of the building and then it became fully engulfed and it was just out of control. The mayor says the restaurant has been around for about 100 years and has drawn visitors from across the country. She says the economic impact will be huge. We also know that it has provided great work for a number of different people in the area. And I know that our hearts go out to the owners, our hearts go out to the staff who could do nothing but stand by and watch this building burn to the ground. The economic impact goes beyond this restaurant and the township of Puzzlint, that our whole city of Cambridge and Waterloo region has had great economic benefit, especially from tourists who come and have a lunch there and then go out and see other attractions or stay in the nearby hotels. Leonardo Jimenez, who had reservations for this weekend and important memories here, says he'll be donating. I'm hoping they'll get back on their feet. The community is already coming together to support the restaurant owner and the staff who worked here who will now be out of work. This is actually the second time that the old marina restaurant burnt down. It burnt down before in the 2000s. The community came together then to see that the restaurant was rebuilt, and many are hoping that the same can happen this time. 
As to what caused the fire, Cambridge Fire is still investigating. Clara Pasika, CBC News, Pooslis, Ontario. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Cinematheque with Stephen Quinn at a gala on August 19th. Enjoy prize draws, culinary delights, and more. Get tickets today at thecinematheque.ca and never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver inbox and keep connected with us. A mother and daughter from Sutina Nation are making their mark on the rodeo circuit in Saskatchewan and beyond. Both compete in professional barrel racing, and now the duo want to inspire other Indigenous women to share their love for the sport. I think this run right here might be one of those. Beautiful women on these beautiful horses running full tilt around three barrels as fast as they can. So much bravery and courage. My name is Sonia Dodging Horse, and I am a professional barrel racer and educator. You get these butterflies before you barrel race. It's like um, this adrenaline. It's just going down that alley. You feel their heartbeat. You feel their hooves pounding in, in that alley. And then they are so ready. It's time to go. You just send them. And then they do their thing. It's like just the most amazing feeling. Riding around the barrels is kind of scary, but you get used to it after a while. And it's just like so much fun and you keep on wanting to do it again and again afterwards. Horses are very a spiritual animal. We used horses to travel, to get from place to place for hunting. They were just a very valuable part of our people. They have the ability to heal your heart. They have the ability to calm your mind and they are sacred medicine for our own spirits. My dad is a champion calf roper, and my brothers are calf ropers, tie-down ropers, and, and team ropers. I just grew up into a family of rodeo and horses, and horses have always been a part of my life. My daughter and I won the INFR title back in 2019, the first mother and daughter duo to ever do that. I am so proud of her. When I'm racing, I want to be like my mom. She's like my biggest inspiration. I want to be her when I'm her age. She's like a bit faster than me, so I try my best to beat her times whenever I'm racing. I was at a couple of pro rodeos, and I did hear some negative talk about Indigenous people, and it really hurt my heart because people out there still have this ignorance towards Indigenous people. To be that strength and show that resiliency to our future daughters is so important. Me and my daughter, I believe, were given this platform from our creator to spread this awareness as a mother and daughter with intergenerational healing. And my parents are both residential school survivors and it has affected our family, it has affected our communities across Canada. And so we raise awareness wherever we go and on our travels. That is just awesome. A little bit scary, a little fast, but I always love seeing women taking up sports traditionally dominated by men. All right, that is our show tonight. Thanks for being with us on CBC Vancouver News at 6 this Wednesday evening. We hope you'll join us tomorrow. Good night.